The egg laying operation at New Cal's largest supplier is impressive. This ranch alone houses one million chickens. It's one of six run by Gipperly Enterprises. And this isn't your grandfather's chicken farm. The biosecurity signs at the front gate send a loud message. This place is serious about contamination. No one, not even the people who work here, are allowed inside without a sterilized jumpsuit and plastic boot covers. The threat of disease is such a big concern, there's one last precaution. You step in and slosh around in a chlorine-like disinfectant before entering the building. There are so many avian health problems outside in the natural environment and the natural um, waterfowl that could devastate poultry that we, we keep them contained in our buildings and keep them protected from the pathogens outside. What's outside is the Central Valley of California. But more importantly, this is directly in the path of the Pacific Flyway the north-south migration route for millions of birds flying between Antarctica and South America. Birds that could be carrying any number of diseases, including the much publicized Asian bird flu and exotic Newcastle disease. Exotic Newcastle devastated flocks in Southern California about five years ago. At Gimberly Enterprises, only four people have keys to these hen houses, and fewer than a half dozen workers are allowed inside. There are two veterinarians on staff here, and Supervisor Jim Robinson monitors these chickens with state-of-the-art technology. This control station tells everything we want to know. The temperature is a constant 80 degrees. The birds have easy access to water, and feed moves through these troughs 24 hours a day. All that contributes to what CEO Steve Gimperly calls the sound of happy chickens. Listen. And a happy chicken is a more productive chicken. 19 million egg-laying hens, 95% of the flock in California, spend their lives in clean, very modern chicken houses like these. What you see hanging from these cages is not filth, it's simply feather lint. And in this place, you've got a lot of feathers. A, a typical house like the one you're in costs about $2 million. And so it's about $12, $13 per chicken. The widespread use of cages more than 20 years ago changed the egg industry. Today, cages are stacked and droppings fall away from the birds down chutes into manure pits. That practically eliminates the exposure to fecal-borne diseases, parasites, and infection. Mortality rates dropped and egg production improved dramatically. When they were able to get the chickens up off the floor into these type of cages, the birds were much more healthy and a lot of the serious diseases that caused a lot of problems in production basically disappeared. Cages have also undergone an evolution. Egg producers are currently phasing in a mandate that gives birds more space. But these cages, 24 inches wide, 20 inches deep, and 20 inches high, aren't as cramped as critics would have you believe. There's even some extra headroom. They've been doing studies to determine what happens as you go to more square inches or less square inches. They found that to be optimal for chickens because they tend to be community type animals anyway that want to huddle together. You can even go into a cage free house and all the chickens will huddle in the corner together because that's the, the nature of a chicken is they want to be together. The life of a chicken is an interesting one. Those raised for the dinner table are sent to market only six or eight weeks after they hatch. But the average lifespan of an egg-laying hen is two years. first and then uh, we'll figure out uh, 
you know, how to set up the committees and how the committee looked good. I mean, it, it depends on what he's, you know, if it's something that's straightforward that won't take a lot of time to discuss, you vote for it. If it's something that, that cuts some program, say you cut programs for the developmentally disabled, we may want those those representatives to come in and tell us how it affects them. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's something that takes, uh, you know, $10 off of somebody's phone bill, I mean, you don't really have to spend a lot of time on it. Do you expect lawmakers to be here on Monday to consider this? Yeah. Well, they don't have to consider it. They just have to be here. Okay. I don't think we're going to put anything How long do you think the Senate will be around uh, before Christmas? I have no idea. What's your line on the Senate? Do you have one? Are there things that, that you're just not willing to... Um, no, I mean, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. They're not going to balance this thing totally on the backs of the poor, the aged, the blind, disabled. You know, uh, everybody steps up to the plate, everybody steps up to the plate, but I mean, there aren't going to be sacred cows and then go after the people who are least able to defend themselves. My, my mother did not bring me into this world to screw around with poor people. But I mean, if everybody's taking a hit, you know, we may have to do some adjustments there, as tough as it may be. But you know, you can't expect other people to uh, step up to the plate. You say, well, you, you know, that's Republicans, well, no new taxes, well, you know. Uh, Fine, no cuts, and then we can be here and then go into bankruptcy, and you could probably buy the capital at an auction. That's not how government works. Given that the numbers now up to in the 24 to 25 yeah. range, you said, is $5 billion enough? Should you be looking at more? Well, $5 billion, a journey of a thousand miles starts with but a single step. Chairman Mao. Did you just make that? <laughs> <laughs> a great philosopher, John Burton, ladies and gentlemen. Dan, how did you get to this point? I mean, you're, you're here all the time. How did we get to this point? Well, oh, it's a long story, but we got to this point basically because revenue spiked up on a temporary basis uh, due to the dot com phenomenon, uh, income taxes on capital gains, stock options in the high tech industry. The legislature and the governor assumed that it was permanent rather than temporary. We had a lot of spending decisions, tax cut decisions based on that, and it turned out that it was just temporary, and the bubble burst, uh, it really burst, and suddenly they're left with a, what's called a structural deficit, more or less, a structural deficit, which means that the, the commitments ongoing and the revenues ongoing are out of whack, maybe right? $15 billion a year, something like that. And uh, that's how we got into this situation. You wrote in uh, one of your columns recently that, that everybody knew this when they passed that budget back in August. Uh, well, they knew it actually, be, they knew it could happen a couple of years ago. In fact, the governor even warned himself that it could happen and said he wasn't going to make commitments based on uh, undependable revenues. And then they turned around and did it. And uh, when the budget was finally passed in September, uh, it was based on a certain deficit number, but everybody knew at that time that it was already out of whack by several billion dollars. And now we're finding out it's out of whack by, oh, maybe as much as $10 billion more just in the current fiscal year, not counting the next one. And so it's... Uh, there's a kind of a quirky thing in state government. I've seen it for 25 years. It's always been there. It's gotten worse. And that is, during an economic downturn, uh, the official estimates tend to not reflect the extent of the downturn in terms of revenues. And then there's an upturn. It tends to lowball the upside as well. So the, the real-life revenue swings are much bigger than what the forecasters say, and they make decisions then based on faulty data. Very often. And this is certainly an example of that. And uh, so when you're on a kind of down mode, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper than anybody figures it can go. And when it's an up mode, it goes up and up and higher and higher and higher than anyone figures it can go. Mm -hmm. And it, it creates this, this crazy boom and bust cycle. And so when it's boom times, they spend a lot of money, make a lot of commitments. And then when the bust happens, they, they scramble with a, a huge deficit. And then the boom comes again, and suddenly they're doing the same thing again. And, and, and the result is just like I say, a kind of a boom and bust cycle that's gotten worse and worse and worse because the swings of those revenues are getting wider and wider because they become more and more dependent on the stock market. This would seem on the surface anyway to be a, a real act of deception. Is it that? Or are these just well-meaning people? I don't know. I think there was, a, there was a conscious deception contained
wasn't in the budget that was enacted earlier this year. It was deceptive in terms of counting revenues that everybody knew didn't exist. It was deceptive in terms of counting spending reductions that everybody knew wouldn't occur. And it was deceptive.